Thank you. That was lovely. My adventure in the rainforest started with a spam email. Dear Joe, I am pleased to be contacting you on behalf of Earth Watch Institute. A generous and anonymous donor has identified you as a teacher of merit and would like to award you with a fully funded fellowship to go on an Earth Watch expedition. <laughs> I deleted that email, I don't know, three or four times before Earth Watch co contacted my boss to convince me that this was for real. <laughs> Earth Watch was founded in 1971 with the mission to engage people worldwide in scientific field research and education to promote the understanding and action necessary for a sustainable environment. Their vision is a world in which we live within our means and in balance with nature. That vision sounds a lot like the seventh UU principle. Earth Watch, Earth Watch funds research that promotes sustainable development. They promote experiential Experiential learning provide more than uh, 110,000 volunteer experiences in since 1971 and more than 1,500 teacher and student, student fellowships like the one I participated in. They also promote conservation through strategic international and community partnerships with the goal of community-based conservation. The expedition I joined was Climate Change, Canopies, and Wildlife, led by Dr. Micah Peck of the University of Sussex. This expedition was sited in the Santa Ligia Reserve, north, in, uh, northwest of Quito in Ecuador. The diverse geography of Ecuador is defined by the Andes Mountains, bisecting the country from north to south. Ecuador is a country about the size of Colorado in the northwest part of South America. So Ecuador is, in, is here. Now we know Ecuador most or best because of the Galapagos Islands. And they're out, out in the ocean and they're approachable from Guayaquil. But Ecuador has incredibly diverse, uh, oh, wait a second. They have very diverse geography where there's a coastal region, an Amazon region here, and then this area in the middle called the Sierra, which is mountains and valleys. Quito here is in the Sierra. And Quito is a very interesting city. You're in the mountains, but you're in a bowl. You look all around you and you're surrounded by mountains. And northwest of Quito, is the Santa Lucia Reserve in an area with mountains and valleys. My homework was to read Tropical Nature, uh, Life and Death in the Rainforest of Central and South America by Adrian Forsyth and Ken Miyataka, which explained about the rainforest ecosystem. The central point of the book as explained in the reading was what, while the rainforest looked and was lush, it was incredibly fragile. The, the purpose of the expedition were to study climate change in the cloud forest, which is particularly sensitive to global warming, examine the canopies, which are lush, lush vegetation similar to a rainforest, and study the wildlife, which include, includes birds and lizards, but not many mammals. So this picture gives you a sense of what the rainforest looks like. The bulk of the rainforest, or what we think of as a rainforest, is this canopy layer, which is completely green as seen from above. There's an emergent layer, some very tall trees that stick up above the canopy, and the understory and other layers down below is what you see as you walk through. It's the jungle you see as you walk through the, the rainforest. Now, while the Santa Lucia Reserve is uh, really called a cloud forest, it has many of the same characteristics as a rainforest. 
Both get more than four meters of rain a year. That's more than 13 feet and have the same fragile ecosystem. The Santa Lucia Reserve is, about one, is at about one mile of elevation and is on a mountainside, while uh, typical lowland rainforests are flat and at lower elevations. The temperature in the cloud forest is comfortable, while the rainforest has, tends to be hot. With my books and expedition notes in hand, I was off to Ecuador at the end of the school year. June 24, 2010, my 62nd birthday, did not start well. I woke early, excited about the start of my adventure in the, San, in the Santa Lucia cloud forest. As I dressed, I found that I had brought two right foot hiking boots. I would like to claim that these boots looked alike, but they really weren't that close. <laughs> Debbie thinks it's my difficulty with distinguishing between left and right, but it was the result of packing in dim light and putting the boots in bags so they would not dirty my clothes. It turns out that six foot two and size 11 and a half feet is a giant in Ecuador. Hiking boots were not to be found in Quito. I was pretty upset. But it, it turns out, however, that hiking boots are not that necessary in the rainforest. It is so muddy that knee-high rubber boots, these are my rubber boots from Ecuador. They're called Wellingtons or Wellies. They're called Wellingtons or Wellies, uh, the preferred what footwear. Those I had been able to find in Ecuador the day before. The ride to the Santa Lucia Reserve, which was much more luxurious than I expected. The small bus had comfortable seats and big windows. It was jammed with Earth, Earth watchers, UK and Ecuadorian scientists and gear. Everyone was excited. After a brief stop in Nag Nagalatato, we went to the trailhead just outside of Nanagal. The welcome sign at the uh, base camp says it all. Welcome, conservation, sustainable tourism. We got off the bus, got our bags lined up for the mules, and set off on a hike to the lodge. The first kilometer was pretty easy walking. Uh, it was uphill, but it was essentially a gravel path. The next two kilometers were not so easy. It was a steep climb on switchbacks. There were sections with steps. The total increase in elevation was half a kilometer. We separated into groups of different hiking ability. The young university students led. Sophia, Simone, and I were in the middle. We were pretty tired when we got to the top. We were greeted with lemonade and punch at the lodge. It tasted, it tasted great. Lunch followed. We devoured it. The lodge at Santa Lucia sits at the edge of the reserve on a ridge in the mountains. The view can be spectacular. Green mountains, green mountain ridges below the tops of clouds, at other times, when there are clouds, the view is non-existent. While there is no view, there is a sense of peace from the deck of the lodge. On our first evening, on our first evening, we were treated to a view of, of a spectacular sunset. At 90 degrees of the sunset, a rainbow formed in the clouds. The sun sets and rises about 6.15 every day because we were at the equator. As we marveled at the colors, our host told us that this was not usual. Often in the evening, clouds and rain blocked the view of, of the sunset. In fact, this was the only evening we saw the sunset. After breakfast on our first full day, Noah Morales, translated by Ernesto Valencio Perez, one of the Ecuadorian scientists, 
briefed us on the history of the Santa Lucia Reserve. The reserve was formed by a cooperative of 20 families trying to maintain a sustainable way of life. The environment had been degraded by farming and hunting, so the families came together to find a way to continue. It was not an easy process. First, they tried farming nanaga, a local food staple, tree tomatoes and blackberries. The harvest was brought to Nanagal by animals, but the minerals on the land were soon depleted and the harvest degraded. Eventually, the Nanaga fields became Sylvie, pa Sylvie pasture land. In 1988, the land became private protected forest, so trees could no longer be cut. The lodge was built in 1999. 25 hectares of fields were reforested and ecotourism has become part of the livelihood of the area. Now 80% of the reserve is primary forest and 10% is reforested secondary forest. Life is still difficult. There are not many children in the reserve. When the children are in school, the families move away, but often return when the children are grown. Following Noe's introduction of the Santa Lucia Reserve, Micah Peck on the right and Tim Kane described the work that would be done during the summer. This expedition has a very broad mandate. The title, Climate Change, Canopies and Wildlife, includes studies of plants, animals, and the effect of temperature changes on the cloud forest. The reserve is considered a biodiversity hotspot because it has lost 70% of vegetation. In past years, Earthwatch has studied the canopies by mounting cameras on a helium balloon and flying a remote-controlled helicopter above the canopy to identify the trees. Unfortunately, the helicopter got lost in the clouds and crashed. The next year, they brought a professional remote helicopter flyer and got some good pictures. This year, the scientists are going to use a catapult to throw ropes over the tree branches. They are then going to climb into the canopy to get samples. Unfortunately, really, really fortunately, this activity is considered too dangerous for Earthwatch volunteers, but we can help from the ground. <laughs> Data loggers have been placed in the reserve at different sites and elevations. Temperature and humidity are measured every 40 minutes. The cloud forest is tough on instruments because of the humidity. The scientists hope to get a picture of the microclimate, the change in the climate a result of clearing trees. Cloud cover changes the temperature in local areas, so it is really difficult to ana analyze the data to quantify the changes. Micah says the cloud cover is moving up one meter per year as a result of increasing temperature. I, I would think that's a hard statement to support with data since the cloud cover is such a dynamic variable. Wildlife will be studied by capturing lizards and traps, sampling bromelides for insects, surveying birds, and, and monitoring camera traps. I was able to spend at least a day on each of these tasks. Bird surveying was surprisingly fun. On the first full day, three Earth watchers went out with Noe and, and Hugo Lingo. These men are very knowledgeable birders. It is crucial since 80% of the birds are identified by sound rather than sight. It was enjoyable just to listen to the sound of the birds in the forest. Uh, just, just for the sake of honesty, they, the hummingbird was viewed from the lodge porch. They put out sugar bird feeders there and it's just like your backyard except there are dozens of hummingbirds there all the time. And the other picture was taken by somebody else, not me. I didn't see any birds. Or actually, I did see one later. Yeah. Vanessa, an Ecuadorian student scientist, was running the project to sample the lizard population. We built four pitfall traps in various areas of the reserve. The pitfall traps rely on 16-liter pails buried in the ground to capture the lizards. The lizards fall in and can't get out. Plastic sheeting is placed on the ground 
as a barrier to guide the lizards to the pails. During the week I was on pitfall traps, we only caught two lizards. It was actually easier to catch the lizards as we walked, walked along the path. Bromeliads are epiphytes, plants that live in trees. They look like the top of a pineapple. Water gets trapped between the leaves. This is a rich environment for animals. The scientists are gonna study the nature of life in the plant at different levels in the forest. We cut one of the bromeliads from the tree and then took it apart very carefully. Every living thing in the plant was collected and examined under a microscope. Each item had to be identified and classified, a very exacting and time-consuming process. Camera traps are placed on several sites around the reserve. As an animal walks by, the camera is triggered and a digital picture taken. Periodically, we walk to the cameras to download the pictures. Hikers are the most frequent animals recorded, <laughs> but there have been some spectacled bears and pumas photographed. The carbon capture project was very meaningful to me. It had an aspect of chemical engineering along with climate change. The objective is to measure how much carbon is taken up by the cloud forest. This is done by measuring the change in size of the trees in parts of the forest over time and relating it to the amount of carbon in the forest. This figure shows the respiration process for a plant. In the simplest form, it takes carbon dioxide and water to produce sugars and oxygen. Most of the mass of sugars and starches end up being the trunk of the tree. So measuring the diameter and the height of the trees would be a reasonable way to estimate the amount of carbon tied up in the tree. To estimate the amount of carbon captured in the cloud forest, we cataloged several 30 meter by 30 meter plots in the reserve. This was the first year it was done. So in addition to measuring the size of the trees, we took samples of the leaves of the trees so we could uh, identify them from the ground. The same plots will be measured every year for five years to get an idea of how fast the forest is growing and how much carbon is being incorporated into the wood. If the concept of carbon credits is adopted, it may be possible for the Santa Lucia Reserve to get some money for maintaining and growing the forest. This was an amazing experience. We were making our way through primary forest off the trail. It was very hard to walk. The ground is steeply sloped and covered with plants and vines. A large pruning pole was used to take some leaves from the trees. If a tree was too, fall, too tall, Noe used the vines on the tree to climb the trunk to the canopy to get some leaves. It was really impressive to see him shimmy up the tree. While he was up there, he got a call on his cell phone. <laughs> we all thought that was pretty ironic. Technology had made it to the rainforest. Maureen and Simone were measuring the wood on the ground around the perimeter of the 30 meter square, while the rest of us were measuring and cataloging the trees within the square. We could hear them laughing and screaming as they tried to make their way through the thick understory. The slope dropped so steeply, all they could do was hold on to a vine and slide down on their bottoms. Here's a photo of their backsides. They were very proud of this shot. <laughs> Micah is the lead scientist on the expedition. He is a kind of Indiana Jones of the cloud forest. He's the real thing. He's passionate about his work but his underlying motivation is the success of the people who live in Ecuador. He is shifting the responsibility of the work from his team in the UK to scientists in Ecuador. He thinks running the project from Ecuador is more sustainable than running it from the UK. After all, this work is about sustainability. On June 27th, Micah and I shared a birthday party after dinner. They made hats out of plants for us to wear. The kitchen staff played the Ecuadorian version of the birthday song. Micah and I were required to dance to the music. He was more into it than I was. In fact, he and Ernesto did the Brazilian fight dance. 
It was clear that the people in the Santa Lucia Reserve loved Micah. They talked about the contribution that he made to their community. It was a nice evening. Anna Mariscal is an Ecuadorian botanist working on the carbon cap capture project. During, during the evening discussion, she talked passionately about the new constitution of Ecuador. The environment is considered to be alive. It is not a thing to be owned, but, some, but something with rights. People in the land must live in harmony. It sounded very Native American. During the week, Anna and I got to know each other better. Anna's working with an NGO to reforest the cloud forest. They have a greenhouse for growing trees outside of Quito. They're having trouble getting water from a cistern to the greenhouse. Since fluid flow is what I'm good at, I volunteered to help her figure out what was going on. After we re returned to Quito, I joined Anna on our trip to the greenhouse. It was about an hour outside of Quito in the mountains. We were joined by her sister, another member of the NGO, and her mother. The greenhouse is located in a town that Anna grew up in. It was interesting to see how the family is intertwined with work. I took some measurements and made some recommendations. The hose is pretty long, but if the tank is full, there should be enough pressure to water the plants. I also made a recommendation of the type of pump that could be used to increase the pressure if needed. Anna also talked about developing passive solar hot water systems for homes in the countryside. I thought that was a great project for my engineering class. I thought my engineering students would develop a solar hot water system for the lodge. However, senioritis is a stronger force than environmentalism. <laughs> my students were not able to apply themselves to a project in April and May, resulting in most of them earning a failing grade on the project and me administering a dressing down to the class that involved using the word disappointed. <laughs> so how have I changed the as a result of this expedition? I know the environment is not just a place. It would be easy to save the environment if all we had to do is get rid of all the people. The harder problem to solve is how to live in our environment in a sustainable way. I used to think of the rainforest as a place. Now I think of it as a way of life. While the forest is a big expanse of trees, plants, and animals, it is also home to people who have made their living for hundreds of years. While the forest looks like a fertile environment, it is really very fragile. Four meters of rain per year provide a vital element of life, but it also washes vital nutrients from the ground. To survive, trees coexist with fungi in the soil. The fungi allow the trees to absorb critical minerals from soil before they are washed away. The traditional way of life involves slashing and burning the vegetation from an area of the forest the burning releases minerals to the soil. That soil will su support crops for a year or two, but eventually all the minerals are washed from the soil, resulting in poor crop yields. It takes 40 years for the soil to build back up to support another crop. It takes one square kilometer to support 10 people. That's a lot of area to support a family. Clearly, traditional agriculture is not sustainable in a rainforest. As you begin to notice the animals, you will soon realize that almost everything you see is different. This, more than any iconic indicator species, characterizes the tropical rainforest environment. It is one of the ironies of tropical rainforest that common species are rare and rare species are common. Just as one animal or plant cannot dominate the rainforest. One way of human life cannot dominate either. The people of Santa Lucia are cobbling together a number of facets of making a living 
so they can have a sustainable life in the cloud forest. It is clear that they love this place and that they love their way of life. They are searching for a combination of money-making activities that will allow them to live in a sustainable fashion. To its credit, Earthwatch is a major factor to their survival. During July and August, the large cabanas are filled with scientists and Earthwatch volunteers. Ecotourism may not be the only answer for Santa Lucia, but is part of the answer. Perhaps the combination of ecotourism and carbon credits will allow the forest to be preserved. The cloud forest is a unique place to visit and appreciate as well as the place that transforms carbon dioxide from the air to oxygen while storing carbon in trees. My time in San Elchia was 12 years ago. What's happened since then? The Ecuador Constitution does consider the environment a living thing. However, the legislature has yet to enact laws to enforce that concept. On the plus side, the Indigenous People's Party is now the second largest party in the legislature and is making progress in enacting those laws. While carbon capture credits are not yet a business practice, Ecuador does receive financial support for projects that protect the environment. Most of this funding comes from groups outside the country. One of Ecuador's largest sources of income, however, is the petrochemical industry. At the present time, oil is necessary for the economy of Ecuador, but they have pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050. Santa Lucia Reserve is still going strong. They offer programs for individual and groups to explore the cloud forest. For $65 per day, you get a room with a shared bathroom and three meals. It goes down to $22 a day if you volunteer to work for two weeks to maintain the reserve. Of course, you have to hike a couple of miles and up a couple of thousand feet, so I don't think any of us will be signing up soon. <laughs> Earthwatch is still in business. The pandemic has been particularly damaging to an organization that promotes international travel and cooperation between groups of people. Many of their research projects were delayed. However, with generous donations and furloughs by the staff, they have survived and have a full slate of expeditions this year. There is no expedition to the Santa Lucia listed though. Back in the reserve on the last day. The last evening in the lodge was a fete. The kitchen staff made an incredible meal and provided the entertainment after the meal. The tables were moved back and the staff played some traditional Ecuadorian songs while we danced. It was a nice party. I shared a table with a couple of ecotourists. They quit their jobs and were traveling around South America and Asia for a year. They were full of interesting stories. Our discussion focused on travel experiences and travel plans for our group. Many of the Earth Watchers were going to Peru, Galapagos, and other exotic destinations before returning home. While they discussed their plans, I was silent. I felt out of place. I had been away from home for two weeks. Two weeks is about my limit. All I wanted to do was return home to be with Debbie, my sons, and, and of course, my granddaughters. Like Dorothy says, there's no place like home. <laughs> this is the time when we ask for your contribution to help sustain and grow our meeting house. Whether you are now in our beautiful building or with us online on Zoom, our ongoing fellowship and organization continues and we appreciate your support. A few, if you are in the sanctuary, there's a collection basket on the table in the back for your contributions. There is also another basket there where you can contribute to our monthly community outreach. This is a good time to get your offering ready to be placed in the basket as you leave. 
We also have a donate button on our website. And of course, you can also mail your offering to the meeting house. Whichever you choose and however it arrives, we are grateful for your generosity. And now let there be an offering to strengthen and sustain this space, this community of memory and of hope, for we are the keepers of the dream. Our closing hymn is number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please rise in body or spirit. Seated. The closing words come from the great Kapok tree, a children's story that describes how the animals and children in the rainforest convince a logger that the rainforest is a beautiful and necessary place. The man stood and picked up his axe. 
He swung back his arm as though to strike the tree. Suddenly he stopped. He turned and looked at the animals and the child. He hesitated. He dropped the axe and walked out of the rainforest. Join me in reciting the words for extinguishing the, uh, the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.